You may be seated this morning, and I want you to take your Bible, and I want you to open to God's Word, Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12. If you are new to our church family, or maybe you have been out for a few weeks, and we uh, previously, in the month of August, took a little break and took some time to talk about spiritual disciplines in the life of the Christian, but we've been studying the book of Acts, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and we're going to resume that today in Acts chapter 12 in verse 19 through verse 25 here in just a moment. This morning, the message is entitled, Fearless. There always seems to be those things in life that require us to respond somewhat fearless. In other words, we've got to face something up or maybe even face something down. You know, whether it's a kid going to school on their first day, that can be a lot of fun, but it can be pretty fearful too. Or maybe it's your first day on college campus as a young freshman, or maybe it's when you're standing there getting ready to get married and you're thinking, oh my goodness, am I ready for this? Or maybe it's because you've just left the doctor's office. Whatever it is, life can throw us a lot of hardship, and just being a Christian within itself can cause us to face some hard things. Do you agree with that? Jesus said in Luke 12, Don't be afraid, little flock, for your Father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. And then the scripture says in Psalm 56, verse 4, in God whose word I praise, in God I have put my trust, I shall not be afraid. What can mere man do to me? Tertullian, who was an early church author, said the Lord challenges us to suffer persecution and to confess him. He wants those who belong to him to be brave and fearless. He himself shows how weakness of the flesh is overcome by courage of the spirit. This is the testimony of the apostles and in particular of the representative administrating spirit. A Christian is fearless. When we look in Acts chapter 12, I believe that the Word of God speaks to us about the fearlessness of the early church. And as a matter of fact, in the verses that I'm going to read in a moment, we're going to read about the demise of King Herod and how Herod's demise actually became an instrument that God used to give the early church confidence to live fearlessly. Now, how many times have you ever read your Bible and you're reading your Bible and you get to a portion of Scripture and you, you ask yourself, I know it's the Word of God, but I don't understand why that was put there. Have you ever had that happen? Sure you have. If you've read your Bible, you read the scripture, and then you'll read something, and you'll wonder, how does this fit within the context of what was taking place? Well, when you read this passage of scripture, at first, you might think that Acts 12, verses 20 through 23, have very little connection to the main point of the narrative that begins in chapter 12 and in verse 1. For some time, Herod had been trying to stop God's plan and provision of the gospel. It's in this passage that we read about in Acts chapter 12 that this Herod had James beheaded. He wanted to murder Peter, but the angel of the Lord intervened. And we see the demise of Herod 
as an instrument that God uses to build confidence in the church and to make them fearless. Uh, Listen to the word of God beginning in Acts 12, verse 19. When Herod had searched for him and had not found him, he examined the guards and ordered that they be led away to execution. Then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and was spending time there. Now, for anyone that's been to Israel, you have been to what's called Caesarea by the Sea. This Caesarea is not Caesarea Philippi in the north. It is Caesarea by the Sea where you stand in that amphitheater and you look out over the Mediterranean Ocean. Verse 20. Now he, meaning Herod, was very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. And with one accord they came to him, and having won over Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they were asking for peace, because their country was fed by the king's country. On an appointed day, Herod, having put on his royal apparel, took his seat on the rostrum and began delivering an address to them. The people kept crying out, the voice of a God and not of a man. And immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give God the glory and he was eaten by worms and he died. But the word of the Lord continued to grow and to be multiplied and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their mission, taking along with them John, who was also called Mark. Now I want you to write down this key thought if you don't have the notes downloaded from online and I want you to remember this very statement. You can live fearlessly for Jesus Christ knowing God's plan and purposes will be fulfilled. I think a lot of times people have fear because they're afraid of the uncertainty of the unknown of the future. Well, I have good news for you this morning. Whatever it is that you face, whatever challenges you go through, whatever trials that come into your life, there is good news because God is not surprised by anything. Do you believe this? And because of that, you can live fearlessly for Jesus Christ, knowing that God's plans and God's purposes will be fulfilled. Now, who was this Herod? Who is this Herod? Because when you read the Bible, there's a lot of people named Herod. Well, Herod the Great from Matthew chapter 2 was in power when Jesus was born. He received the wise men and he was the one who massacred all of the children. It was Herod Antipas who consented to the death of John the Baptist. He was also Herod to whom Pilate sent Jesus for trial. But this is what we know to be Herod Agrippa. He was the grandson of Herod the Great. Paul one day stood before Herod Agrippa's son, Agrippa II, And this Herod was one who had been raised and educated in Rome. It was this Herod, this Herod Agrippa, who put James to death, put Peter in prison, and according to Acts chapter 12, had intended to execute Peter had the angel of the Lord not released him. Now the Bible tells us that after these horrific things, Herod one day stood up, it's believed it was on his 54th birthday in the seventh year of his reign, that he put on this dazzling silver garment, and in doing so, he gave an oration, and look what the Bible says. The Bible says the people kept crying out, the voice of a God and not of a man. And immediately... An angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give the glory to God and he was eaten by worms and he died. Now, I don't know about you. There's a lot of bad ways to die, but being eaten by worms certainly has to be one of them. There's been a lot of speculation about what that was. 
There's actually, because there's a lot of sheep in that area, it's believed that there was a certain type of worm that came from the sheep, that if a human got that worm, that it would create a problem in their intestinal system and they would die. There, there's a lot of guesses. I'm a dad and I'm a granddad, so let me give you a few dad jokes. What do worms leave around the bath? The scum of the earth. What is the worm army called? The apple core. See, these are dad jokes, right? I don't know what the real reason is that he was reading. I, I understand the reason why Herod Agrippa was eaten by worms. What I really don't know is what medically might have happened. I just choose to take the scripture at its word and just simply say, Herod was eaten by worms. When we look at this passage of Scripture, you ask the question, how is the death and demise of Herod Agrippa connected to anything in the book of Acts? Because when you look at chapter 13, we're going to get into Paul's first missionary journey next week, and you ask, why is this short section of Scripture included? Because when you started Acts chapter 12, it's all about James and Peter, and now there's this moment where we learn about the death of Herod Agrippa. I believe it's this. When you study the book of Acts, it is all about the spreading of the gospel. And it began in Jerusalem, and then it became to the ends of the earth. When, when God called up Paul and sent him as the apostle to the Gentiles, and we see through Peter that the door was open to the Jewish people, to the Gentiles, being accepted into the kingdom of God's family. And, and we see this massive movement of the gospel, and the enemy hates it when the cross is advancing, and the enemy hates it when the gospel is being proclaimed. And as a result of this, Herod, an earthly man, was wanting to do everything he could to put down the apostles and the witness of the early church. And God said, I've had enough. And it was through his demise and through his death that the early church recognized that God is greater than anyone or anything and they lived fearlessly. Three things I want to show you in Acts chapter 12 in this passage. In this passage, we're reminded to be confident in the greatness of God. The story of Herod Agrippa's death seems only indirectly related to the author's main interest, which is the spread of the growth of the gospel and the growth of the church. But there's two things about this. God executes his judgment in the world. Do you ever look around and, and wonder why there is so much injustice and why it seems like some people don't go to jail when they should? Uh, let me just mention, well, no, I'm not going to mention anybody's name. And then other people go to jail and you wonder why, right? Or, or maybe it seems like people that are far from God, uh, you, you ask yourself, well, why do certain people seem to just prosper, but they hate God and they deny Jesus and they reject the Bible and, and yet they seem to have all of these blessings in life. God, God, why don't you do something about that now? John Gerstner, church history professor, mentioned in a sermon that one of his friends had done a master's thesis on the very subject of the judgment and wrath of God. And in that master's thesis, he said, for every reference to God's mercy and grace in the Bible, both Old and New Testament, there are three references to his judgment, his wrath, or his anger at sin. What's the point? When you and I see things happen in this world that seem unfair or unjust, I, I just want to remind you that God is greater than anyone or anything, and the wages of sin 
always leads to death. Do you believe this? The Bible says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. I, I believe that this story is included in Acts chapter 12 to remind the early church and to remind us that we can be confident in the greatness of God and that God does not overlook and ignore the need to exercise judgment, wrath, and righteousness. The problem is, sometimes God's judgment and his ways seem mysterious to us. You would have thought, look back in Acts chapter 12, verse 1. Now about that time, Herod the king laid hands on some who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them, and he had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. Now you and I, humanly, we would think, God, why didn't you act then? Why didn't you, at that moment, when, when Herod the king uh, were, were, was mistreating believers and when he was taking James to put him to death by the sword, God, why didn't you act then? Or maybe when Peter was put in prison and, and he was locked up and chained up and the execution was planned, God, why did you do something then? I want to remind us that there is a mystery to the ways of God. But there is no mystery to the greatness of God. And here's what we need to remember. No one escapes the ultimate judgment of God's righteous and holy indignation against sin. That's a sobering thought, isn't it? You can live every day confident in the greatness of God, knowing that God will act and ultimately God will deal with every sin and every sinner. I want you to remember to be confident in the greatness of God. Secondly, I want you to be careful to give all glory and praise to God. Notice what happens in this passage. The Bible tells us in Acts 12 that Herod got up. Uh, evidently, he was angry with Tyre and Sidon. We really don't know why he was angry with them, but in verse 20 it says he was very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. And so what they did was they came and probably they probably bribed Blastus, the king's chamberlain, and they were asking for peace because they were totally dependent on King Agrippa's country for the food sources for their people. And so they came and they began to cry out. And, and, and on that day, whether it was his 54th birthday and his seventh anniversary as king, Herod Agrippa got up and he was, he was robed in this dazzling silver splendorous array and he began to give an oration. And the people said, the voice of a God and not a man. The Jewish historian Josephus said that the king arrayed himself in a garment woven with silver threads. When the sun's rays fell upon the robe, it glittered and shone with a resplendence that dazzled the crowds that were packed into the theater. They were there at Caesarea by the sea. Some believe it was on the occasion that he was making this declaration John Philip said, Herod had gone too far. He had exhausted the patience of God. He had crossed the hidden boundary between God's mercy and God's wrath. Isaiah 42 verse 8 says, I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven images. Look what happens. Immediately, an angel of the Lord struck him. I don't always understand God's timing, why God didn't act when James was martyred or when Peter was put in prison. But I know that, that God's glory is a very serious matter. As a matter of fact, in the Old Testament, the most common word for glory is the Hebrew word kabod. 
and it means heavy in weight. When you glorify someone, you recognize his importance or the weight or the uniqueness that they possess. In the New Testament, the most common word is the word doxazo, and its usage is meant to convey a sense of brilliance or radiance. We read of Solomon in all of his glory in Matthew 6, 29. We read in Matthew 4, 8, all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. What does it mean to give glory to God? It means to live and speak sincerely and from the heart about his amazing nature or deeds. The glory of God is the manifest beauty of his holiness. The glory of God is the infinite beauty and greatness of God's manifold perfections. And Herod, what was his problem? The problem with Herod is the same problem that has been man's problem forever, and that is pride. Herod had elevated himself up to a place, puffed up with pride. He saw himself as even greater than God, and rather than giving glory to God, he wanted all of the glory to come to himself. Sounds like many of the narcissistic politicians we have in our own country. It was at that moment when the people were crying out the voice of a God and not of a man that the angel of the Lord struck him and he died being eaten by worms. It's said that when he began to get sick that Herod died five days later in excruciating pain. I think we need to be very, very careful to be sure that it is God who gets all the glory. You know, flattery is an interesting thing. The Bible warns us about the dangers of flattery. If you're not careful when someone is always praising you, you may become puffed up with pride and arrogance and want all the attention to come to yourself. Be careful to give all glory to God. You know, it's interesting. Take your Bible, and I want you to look in Romans with me. Romans chapter 3. In Romans chapter 3, a very familiar passage of Scripture, the Bible says, all have sinned and fallen short of what? The glory of God. Now take your Bible and go back to Romans chapter 1, and I want you to look at verse 23. But I'm going to begin reading in verse 22. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. At the very core of our sinful condition and at the core of our sinful acts is when you and I, rather than glorifying God as God, we try to steal his glory and we want to elevate ourselves with pride and self-centeredness, the Bible says God will not share his glory with anyone. Uh, Rick and I talk about this often. Where is Rick? There he is. We talk about this right here, don't we, Rick? Rick and I talk about the platform and how we have to guard our hearts and minds about not being enamored with the platform. Because the fact of the matter is, when you stand on a platform in front of a lot of people, if you're not careful, you'll begin to think you're something special. You'll begin to think that it's all about you. And you can become self-centered and narcissistic and and all of those other things. And and the fact of the matter is, everything we do here, listen, I appreciate the compliments and Rick and I appreciate the way that you encourage us all of the time and we are so grateful for that. But you know what? It is so important that we stay grounded and know none of this is about us. 
be careful that we give all the glory to the Lord. All the great things that God is doing in the life of Whitesburg Baptist Church, the, the baptisms, the new people, the growth, all the things that we see happening. Let's talk about how great our God is. I appreciate our staff. We got a great staff. I like to brag on them. Let's brag on them, but not so much that we think it's them. Let's don't brag on me. Don't brag on Rick. Let's brag on Jesus. Amen. Let's make much of Jesus because he is the one who is worthy of all praise, all glory. Herod was exalted by man, but humbled by God. Two things this passage reminds us of. Be confident in the greatness of God. Be careful to give God all of the glory. But here's where I really think the crux of this passage is all about. Be confident in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, look what it says here. It's very interesting. Uh, it, it's just two statements that you may miss. In verse 24, the word of the Lord continued to grow and be multiplied. And then secondly, and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their mission. I want to make two statements. Number one, God's purposes will not be thwarted. Amen? God's purposes will not be thwarted. And I think that when the early church was facing all of this persecution, when, when Herod murdered James and put Peter in prison, I don't know about you, but if, if I'm there and I'm looking at what's happening, it would be so easy to be discouraged by the things around us. You hear all the time about people and the numbers of church members declining across the country and all of this kind of thing. But if you're not careful, you begin to read the clippings and you'll forget that Jesus said that hell itself cannot overcome the church of the living God. That gates of hell shall not prevail. Amen? You cannot thwart the purposes of God. Here's another way of saying it. If you oppose Jesus, you lose. If you oppose Jesus, you lose. This simple statement, the word of God continued to grow. Don't be discouraged. Don't look around and think, oh my goodness, we're losing in the world. The church of the living God is not losing. The church of the living God will accomplish everything that the sovereign God of heaven intends for it to accomplish because God is great and there is no other. He is the one who will receive all glory and praise and his kingdom will advance. His kingdom will come when he says, Jesus, go bring my children home. And you and I can live every day confident that Jesus is Lord and the church will advance according to the will of God. Amen? So three things I want you to think about. I want you this morning as you think about this passage and you wonder why it's included in Acts chapter 12, it's included to say to the church, you can live fearlessly in the face of anything this world throws at you. Because God is greater. His glory is magnificent. And his gospel cannot be overcome. Here's three statements for you. I want you to trust God. And I want you to pray persistently. I want you and I to trust God and I want us to pray unlike we have ever prayed before because God works through the prayers of his people. I don't know how many of you got to be here last Sunday night, but it was like heaven on earth at Whitesburg Baptist Church last Sunday night. Amen. 
If you were here and you were blessed, just give God praise this morning. He is worthy of that. It was an amazing night of prayer and an amazing night of praise. Trust God and pray persistently. Trust God and preach passionately. Now, when I use the word preach, I'm using it in the form of to tell the good news. Knowing this, that I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to them that believe. Meaning that there may be those that reject it, there may be those that deny it, but I'm telling you that the more people we tell about Jesus, the more the power of the gospel is going to convict men of their sin and draw them to the Savior. Preach the gospel passionately. Tell people about Jesus constantly. And I believe with all of my heart that no matter what opposition the gospel faces, the gospel is mightier than anything else. Pray persistently. Preach passionately. But trust God and persevere patiently. I wish life was easy. I wish that nobody got sick. I wish that people didn't lose their jobs and I wish that people didn't have marriage problems and I wish nobody hurt your feelings with micro or macro aggressions. <laughs> but that's not the fallen world in which we live. And as you and I pray, and as we preach the gospel, we, we've got to patiently endure knowing this, that our God is faithful. Would you stand this morning? You know, I, I have a feeling that <clears throat> I may be speaking to someone who truth of the matter is you've thought about giving up. You're sitting here this morning in this service and nobody knows it around you, but you thought, you know, I, I've, been, I've been going to church a long time and I'm just kind of tired. Or I've been trying to live a Christian life for a long time and it's just hard. Maybe you've thought about giving up and giving in. But when you read this, I want you to be reminded that all that the church was walking through, they were encouraged to live fearlessly. And sometimes to live fearlessly requires you to live patiently, trusting in God to get you through. So here's the invitation. If you're here this morning and you just need to be encouraged in the Lord to keep going, you need somebody to pray with you or for you, or maybe you want to pray for someone that's a loved one or a friend or a family member that seems to be struggling. We have pastors in the balcony. We have Cody and uh, Justin is going to be there to help as well. And we'll have pastors down here. And if you just want somebody to pray for you or to pray with you about something, we believe there's power in prayer. If you're online, you can pray with the online pastor. Just get in that text portal. He'll pray with you. Maybe you're here this morning and the Spirit of God has been speaking to you and you say this, I'm not a Christian, Daryl. But I, I need to know that I've been forgiven for my sin and that Jesus is my Savior. Would you come and speak with one of us? We'd love to share with you how Jesus Christ loves you, died for you, and rose that you might have life. Whatever it is God's speaking in your life, I want you to know we're here to help you. Father God, I want to pray and ask that your Holy Spirit will guide us. God, we really do need to be encouraged every now and then when life is hard 
and we wonder where there's justice. Why isn't justice being done? God, we trust that you are a just, a righteous, and a holy God, and that you act in accordance with your will. And I pray, God, that right now you will encourage all of us to live fearlessly and faithfully for you. We pray this in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen.